This video covers farming systems in the 3.5 million dryland acres in Washington and Oregon that receive less than 12 inches of precipitation per year. We will discuss the current cropping systems, some of the problems in the area, and some innovative solutions developed by farmers and researchers. Our goal is to give you an understanding of new tillage systems. This short video cannot be all-inclusive, and we encourage you to get additional information from researchers, extension educators, agency people, retailers, and fellow farmers before changing your farming practices. Due to the lack of moisture, the cropping system in this area is predominantly winter wheat, summer fallow. Farmers try to save the precipitation of two winters to grow one crop of winter wheat. As Dr. Bill Schillinger from the Washington State University Dryland Research Station in Lind explains. So what we have is a winter wheat fallow system. One crop every other year. And traditionally what farmers have done, and this has gone on essentially since this, these uh, soils have been farmed starting about 125 years ago, is uh, the tillage during the summer fallow period is quite intensive. And uh, generally what that means is that farmers will go over their ground with tillage implements eight or more times during the 12 or 13 month fallow period. In order to set a moisture line in the soil and control water-consuming weeds, farmers use a variety of tillage systems. Farmer Derek Schaefer from Rootsville describes their traditional system. A typical system that my grandfather might have used would have been a um, conventional system. Uh, after harvest, he would have used the sweep if there would be any weeds to sweep. Um, and later in the fall, would use the chisel plow and then he didn't have glyphosate available to him so he would in the spring uh, first operation might be with a, a disc and after that might be uh, cultivate one pass and then he would be able to use uh, some some rod weeders um, and they've changed a little bit over the years but basically the rod weeder has, has remained unchanged over time the system my father used changed a little bit um, they had some more chemicals available uh, in his time on the farm <clears throat> and so he he was able to use glyphosate in the spring he normally would have used the chisel plow in the fall after harvest as well but in the spring he might have used glyphosate depending on the year how much growth was out there and then he probably would have utilized most most of the time he did utilize a cultivator, uh, two passes with a cultivator, and then he was able to use the rod weeders. Um, sometimes if there was a lot of residue, he might have to cultivate three times. So depending on the year um, and how much residue was out there, the operations did change slightly. But that was basically the, the method that was used. Winter wheat yields are generally in the 25 to 50 bushel per acre range which often results in low crop residue cover on the soils during fallow. The area contains many light, sandy, silt loam soils, which are very prone to wind erosion. Researchers and farmers have tried alternative cropping systems to solve some of the environmental issues. We've tried many other types of cropping systems, the farmers and the researchers both. Uh, one of those is uh, no-till with uh, intensified cropping which is an ideal situation for wind erosion control because of course we're not uh, tilling the soil and we're also growing as many crops as we can. Uh, however and unfortunately with current technology that system has not worked very well. Uh, it's very risky uh, especially in these low rainfall regions uh, where we're heavily reliant on uh, overwinter stored water for our crop. Uh, those, those systems haven't worked very well, the intensified cropping and the no-till. Uh, they work fine in the intermediate and high rainfall regions, however, and they have great potential there. And possibly they have great potential in this low rainfall region as well, but we don't have that technology as yet or haven't found that. One of the reasons the chemical fallow has not been widely adopted is greater loss of soil moisture from the seed zone compared to tilled fallow. It's been uh, utilized quite successfully in the U.S. Great Plains in Canada. Uh, we, we have tested that a lot here in these drier regions of the inland Pacific Northwest 
And uh, what basically happens is that uh, since we are not breaking soil capillary continuity that, like we do with tillage, uh, liquid water has a tendency to move right to the surface and evaporate quite extensively. Uh, so uh, that, has not, that has not worked very well. We, we've even gone to the point where we've added uh, up to eight tons or 8,000 pounds of residue to the chemical summer follow, seeing if that would really make a difference. Because a lot of these farmers are saying, well, if I, if I uh, go into a no-till system and stick with it long enough, I'm going to build up a lot of residue and a duff layer and, and what have you, which will retard uh, uh, the, uh, uh, which will keep the soils cooler. And uh, we have found that that uh, certainly is the case up until about mid-July. And then what happens after that is then, it, then we start losing it in the chemical summer follow, even if we have lots of residue on the surface. And the basic reason behind that is, is that we don't have very much stored water in, in the soil. So we lose the water. And what that means to the farmer is, is that he can't go out and plant wheat in late August or early September like he wants to to get his optimum yield. Instead, he has to either what's called dust the seed in and wait for rain or uh, wait for rain to occur uh, and then, then seed at a shallow depth. And that usually doesn't take place. The rains don't take place until about mid-October or later. And we know for certain that uh, late planted wheat in this dry region does not yield as well as early planted wheat. So that's the main reason chemical follow is not being practiced out here. One system that has worked well for the area uses a tillage tool called an undercutter. It has wide V-shaped blades with narrow pitch designed to slice underneath the soil with minimal soil lifting. In this system, the farmer uses the undercutter in the spring of the fallow year for primary tillage and to apply fertilizer in one pass. After the undercutter, a rod weeder is used one to three times to control weeds. Uh, back in uh, 1993, we started a long-term experiment right here at the Lind Research Station to look at ways where we could uh, reduce that amount of, of tillage. And in particular, uh, we, we said, well, let's try to do, a, uh, let's try to, a, a system where we do no mixing and stirring of the surface whatsoever. And with the, the help of the Adams Conservation District, we, we borrowed their Haybuster Undercutter implement, which is a wide blade sweep with narrow pitch, uh, hooked up for fertilizer delivery, and we, and we used that in a six-year trial here at the station where we compared uh, traditional tillage which involves those eight or more tillage operations, to uh, what we call a minimum tillage system, which is going out with the undercutter in the spring, uh, doing our primary tillage with that at a depth of about five inches, and injecting our uh, liquid aqua fertilizer at the same time. So, so doing two operations in one pass, and then following that up with just two or three rod weedings. And that is our entire follow system. Uh, and we, uh, during this six-year period, we of course took several measurements and that included residue level, surface roughness, surface cloddiness, overall seed zone water content in the six-foot profile, and also, which is most important from the farmer standpoint, seed zone water content at time of planting. After the positive research results, farmers have tried the undercutter system too. Currently, we're trying some new systems and the first and foremost new system we're trying is the undercutter method. And we first saw this method, um, oh it's been four or five years ago at least, um, that Dr. Schillinger had uh, started using this method down at the station. And we tried it on limited acres at first. Our primary reason for wanting to try a new system um, was one, conservation and Two, to try to reduce the number of passes over the field to save fuel and save resources. And since that time we've expanded the acreage and while we don't have our entire farm uh, under this system, we're getting a lot more confidence in it and we've added uh, significantly more acres in the past couple of years. We went out year after year and measured not only water in the six foot profile, but water where it's really critical at seeding time in that seed zone. And that's uh, you know, at the six to eight inch depth. 
And we found that there was never any difference in seed zone water content where we use the undercutter versus where we use conventional tillage. And then the bottom line is, of course, the grain yields, which we measured again for six years. And again, we had no difference in, in grain yield whatsoever. So the bottom line on all of this is that we think we have developed, a, a number of us, a win-win situation for the farmers in this region where wind erosion is a huge problem. As with any farming practice, change takes time and patience. Our experience with the system is, is a fairly steep learning curve. It's like any other system. You don't learn to do it in one year. Um, even people who have adopted no-till learn continuously and the it's, same goes with this system. Uh, some of the things that we've learned uh, this year include uh, trying to size the amount of clods. Uh, while we want to maintain a decent clod size out there, depending on the soil texture, we've had some problems with the clods being too big. And we think that we can solve that with possibly pulling a single uh, skew treader um, or some type of rotary hoe behind the undercutter. And it wouldn't disturb the residue, but yet it would basically poke holes in those clods and size those clods. On lighter soils or sandier soils, the undercutter works fabulous. There's, we've had no trouble in those soils. One thing both researchers and farmers have found to be crucial is to cut the straw fairly close to the ground at harvest to reduce the likelihood of plugging grain drills. The initial setup of the machine is also important. One of the other things we've learned in this system is with this specific tool, the Haybuster undercutter, um, that the adjustment of the machine is critical to make the, making the system work. If you don't spend time adjusting it, leveling it up, and adjusting the pitch on the blades, you're going to be very unhappy with it. And there are other uh, tools available for this as well, um, wide V undercutter type tools, but this is the this hay buster undercutter is the one that we are currently using. One of the most critical things otherwise is to make sure that this machine is running level. And your your front beam going to the tractor, your main tongue. I've I've gone to the gotten to the point where I'll carry a jack and I'll jack it up and change the pull points where the pins go through the hitch assembly. And sometimes that inch and a half or two inches, whatever it is, is, is too much. So I have little round spacer washers for going on the drawbar that I've cut. Just use half inch material. I might put one in or I might put two in, but that, that usually is enough to get me to that, that finer adjustment to get the frame running level. Uh, the other adjustment that some you have to play with as your blades get worn is right here is a turnbuckle arrangement and as your blades get worn they don't have as much suck to them to pull in the ground main thing is just patience it just takes some time to get this thing set up more so than most other equipment that people run researchers and retailers are working with manufacturers to get machines available soon for this area some units might be available for custom tillage others for rent or purchase. Manufacturers such as Great Plains makes machines similar to the Haybuster undercutter, but we have not yet performed research with this machine. Economic analysis at Washington State University has shown that using the undercutter is more profitable than conventional tillage. As fuel prices went up and glyphosate prices dropped, conventional tillage lost 9% profitability between 1998 and 2005, while the undercutter method gained 2% profitability. As fuel prices continue to rise, the undercutter method will likely continue to provide a greater return than conventional tillage. In summary, the undercutter method for summer fallow is a system that reduces tillage passes, increases profitability, and is good for the environment. The Washington Association of Wheat Growers has obtained a large grant from the Natural Resources Conservation Service 
to help producers obtain undercutters by cost sharing.